Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the College of Complexes and uh, to our topic tonight, Jesus. Jesus Christ. And, Baby Jesus. and we have a uh, from Jesus Connection. Are you connected? Yes. yes. No. No. Why not? Hey. No, not at all. all Smoke right. and dope every week. Come on. You only think you're not connected. I'm connected ha, with the ha, devil, ha. Satan. But there are all sorts of Hi. everybody. Yeah. Oh, cheers. Our speaker. Oh, boy, dog. Thank you. As I said earlier, it's always good to present before a small instrument. <coughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess, uh, you know, I suppose, I suppose I should have full disclosure before I start that I am a diet in the wool, full bread, uh, Roman Catholic. And, uh, you know, in, in the Roman Catholic times, you know, we spoke Latin, so. Uh, I suppose I should say, you know, Dominus Vobiscum, which translated means the Lord be with you tonight. And uh, I have a little joke about that, that there, there was a story about uh, a couple of guys that weren't Catholic and they were hanging out in front of the church and they didn't know what went outside the church. So one of them went in and for the other guy and he said, I'll find out what's going on. And you know, he, you know, the, the mass at that time was in Latin. It wasn't as it is today in the vernacular of English. And uh, he took it in for a while. And after uh, church got out, he met up with his friend again, and he says, "Okay, what, what went on in there? You know, uh, what, what do they do?" And he says, "Well, there's this guy that stands in front of the room, and he gets up, and he says to the crowd, does anyone want to play dominoes?'" <laughs> and uh, and after that, then they run around the church taking up bets. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very cool. All right, thank you. So at any rate, uh, I was trying to figure out how to, you know, get the joke. <laughs> you don't hang it up around around enough churches. That's a joke. I understand what it's saying. Well, I'll explain it to you afterwards, Charlie. Some people got it. That's the important. At any rate, what what I wanted to do tonight was was to, to figure out how to start this topic. And uh, one of the things, you know, on Saturday afternoons at about five o'clock, they run old episodes of Superman. And I imagine all, all of you that are here kind of remember how it went. But it, just in case you don't, I'll I'll refresh your memories. It goes like this, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look, up there in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, who came to us as a visitor from another planet with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men, who could change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, a mild man, a reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. Now, having heard that, I sort of had a moment of inspiration for tonight's talk. And I put this little ditty together to start the talk, and it goes like this. Writer then the sun, being without sin, can cast the first stone, and able to walk on water. Look, out there in the heavens, it's a ghost, it's Elijah. No, it's Jesus Christ Superstar. Yes, it's Jesus Christ Superstar, who came to us as a child with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men, who could change water into wine, bring the dead back to life, and himself, and who disguised as the foster son of Joseph, a humble carpenter in Nazareth, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the Christian way. 
I guess it didn't go over well. Yeah, Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading it to someone a little younger than you guys. She thought it was hilarious. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you're, uh, I, I kind of written out what I'm going to say tonight. I don't want to miss any of these important points, but let me start by saying the exact nature and purpose of Jesus in history has been both troublesome for us today and for the people of his time. The Catholic Church and other Christian religions preach Jesus as having both a human and divine nature as the Son of God. What I want to cover in this presentation are the origins of these claims in terms of scripture, religious beliefs, and the Christmas tradition. This phrase is often repeated by Christians at this time. Jesus is the reason for the season. And the merchants of today couldn't be happier to hear this. The best place to begin is with the birth of Jesus, much covered in the Christmas tradition, in the readings and carols. The dictionary defines carol as a song of joy or devotion. Just as a note of interest, the line, Mary's boy child, born on Christmas Day in today's description, was taken from a Calypso carol. And I'm sure many of you related immediately to the reference to the carol, God rest you, Mary gentlemen, in the title. Now, I, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you ever heard that Christmas uh, carol that, that had the, the Calypso melody. Uh, but uh, the uh, Kingston Trio and Harry Belafonte and a group called Boney M uh, recorded it one time. And it goes like this. A long time ago in Bethlehem, the holy books say, Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, was born on Christmas Day. Hark now, hear the angels sing, a new king born today, and man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. I thought it was a very quaint song because of the fact that, you know, they have Jesus being born on Christmas Day. Actually, he's the one that made the day. But, uh, you know, I guess in, in the island countries, they have made a lot of sense. And they have a line in here about trumpet sound and the angels singing, listen to what they sing. And again, they repeat the line, hark now the angels sing, a newborn king born today. So, um, in the words of God rest you merry men, we are to have tidings of joy and comfort because Jesus Christ our Savior was born to save us from Satan's power since we had gone astray leading amoral lives in the 1800s. In the reading from Isaiah, Jesus' birth name is described for us as Wonder Counselor, God Hero, Father Forever, Prince of Peace. Handel worked these descriptions into his hymn that is usually sung during the Christmas Midnight Mass broadcast from Holy Name Cathedral. And the title of it is, For Unto Us is Born a Child. And I'm going to play it here, if I can get my things together. Yes, music. Uh, maybe uh, get it going. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, let's see. I got the, I got the CD, CD there. Got a funny thing. Thank you. 
shepherds attending their flock that in Bethlehem a Savior was born and that we should go tell it on the mountain. I think that the most enduring and lasting feature of Christmas is that it is a celebration for new life brought into the world and of the potential that each newborn has for the betterment of mankind. Hopefully some of them will come to the College of Complexes. <laughs> okay, but again in Luke, Jesus assumes the. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the page here. Got ahead of myself. So why did God become man? Yeah. And uh, this was a title uh, used in a book that I read on the Creed, uh, written by uh, Bernard L. Mothlier. Actually, he did it in Latin, and the, and, and the question was uh, that was put by Saint Aslam of Canterbury in the year 1109. Cur Deus Homo. Well, I just read, why did God become man? The basic facet of Jesus coming is logos, which is a Greek word for the word of God, was to set the record straight for us mortals as to what was important for living our lives on earth. In addition to explaining how to gain our salvation in the afterlife, the Gospel of John, which is read at the Catholic Mass during the day on Christmas, and was read at every Latin Mass at the end as the last Gospel, is proclaimed as follows. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through Him, and without Him nothing came to be. What came to be through Him was light, and this light was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we saw His glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Now this phrase, Father's Son, was echoed on two different occasions in the Gospel of Scripture. The first occasion was at the end of uh, Jesus' baptism by John, his cousin, in the river of Jordan. After Jesus was baptized, He came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This was in the Gospel of Matthew. The second occasion happened during the Transfiguration, when Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light, while Peter, James, and John were with him on a high mountain. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Again, this is the Gospel of Matthew. And then in the Gospel of Luke, uh, he gives us a small glimpse of the future ministry of Jesus. In the story of Jesus being found in the temple in Jerusalem during Passover, when he was 12 years old by his mother Mary and his foster father Joseph. And it goes like this, after three days of searching, they found him in the temple, sitting with the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. In response to his mother's query, why Jesus had heaped a great anxiety on them and made them go searching, he replied, 
Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So, again, Jesus assumes the role of rabbi it, well, with two of his disciples. This is, takes place after the resurrection while they were on the road to Emmaus, a village seven miles from Jerusalem. The afternoon of the resurrection, Jesus plays dumb about the things they had happened to him. Of course, this is the risen Lord. Over the last several days, they did not recognize Jesus at first. So they treated him as a stranger and recounted for him how Jesus and Nazarene had a prophet, a prophet mighty indeed in word before God, had been sentenced to death and crucified. The people were hoping that he would be the redeemer of Israel. Jesus tries to put his death into perspective as a necessary part of God's plan for mankind by interpreting for them through scripture from Moses and all the prophets uh, that, that reference the Messiah. When they reached the village, Jesus stayed for supper with them. And while at table, he broke bread. At that point, they recognized him because their eyes had been opened and he vanished. And this, was in the, this gospel was done in the third Sunday after Easter in cycle A. Luke re, uh, relates this passage to us in chapter 9 that fits in with the topic tonight. Once when Jesus was praying in solitude and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah. So others, one of the ancient prophets. Then he said to Peter, But who do you say I am? He replied, The Messiah of God. Matthew, in his uh, gospel, gives us the following response. Uh, Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. I think the point it would be good is to re briefly reflect on the brief reference uh, to Jesus as being a fish. And if, for those of you who don't know, the word fish uh, in Greek is ichthyus. And, you know, in, 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 in the Greek words, it's Jesus Christos Theo Ios Soter, which translated in English is Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Now, this, uh, using the symbol of the fish is how the early Christians, while under persecution by the Romans, would secretly identify themselves in public. And I have here a little card that shows that for you. Uh, you know, I think you know, everyone knows that we have gang signs today. You know, some way you wear your hat or your trousers or something. And so, you know, uh, but today's gangs weren't the first one to use symbols to identify each other. And if you were a Christian uh, in Roman times under persecution, the way you would identify your fellow Christians is that you would meet, you know, in a darkened place, or you would make a sign in, in the sand, and it looks something like this. First, you would make a, you see it, the blue line, an arch, okay? Okay. So at any rate, and then if the person you were with would pick up on it, and he would finish the arch and have the form of a fish. See? So that ties in with well, how come Jesus came, uh, you know, identified with the word fish. And also, if you look at a lot of Christian symbols in the churches, you'll see the symbol of a fish. So according to Bernard Muther, uh, a Franciscan that was author of this book called The Creed, and I got it here. It's a big book. Very interesting book, by the way, if you're into uh, studying theology or want to know more background. Uh, he says uh, he has a title, a chapter on the, on the names and titles of Jesus. Jesus is actually the Greek form of the word Yahshua, which is a shortened ver uh, version of Joshua. And it was a common name at the beginning of the Christian era. And 
Yahshua, Jesus means Yahweh saves. The Messiah was translated into Greek as Christos, which designates one to be anointed. Okay. So it is to be uh, someone who would be uh, singled out for a special mission by God. And the title for this talk, you know, if you looked at your uh, flyers, uh, I had capitalized I am. And the capitalization I did was in reference to Moses' approach to the burning bush, where he asked God to identify himself. You know, because he, God's instructed Moses to go back to Egypt and free uh, his people, Israel, from the Egyptians. And he says, you know, how do I tell them who you are? And God responds, I am who I am. Yahweh's an archaic form of the verb to be. Uh, says Martha Fowler. It, it, connotes, it connotes God's relationship with Israel. According to the Nicene Creed, named for the Council of Nicaea that it held in 325, uh, in ancient, uh, uh, Nicaea, in case you're interested, is an ancient city in northwest Asia, which today uh, is the Turkish village of Iznik, uh, which is located about 60 miles from Istanbul. Jesus being the only Son of God was eternally begotten of the Father, not made and having the same substance with the Father who was created of all things visible and invisible and maker of heaven and earth. Uh, today in our creed we replace one in being with the word consubstantial, uh, which lies closer to the Latin equivalent of consubstantialis which was used in the Latin, Latin credo and more accurately describes the relationship between Jesus and the Father. Following the logic of this statement, it's entirely feasible that Jesus was also present in the burning bush on Mount Horeb, uh, which is called the Mount of God in Exodus. And it may have been Jesus who spoke to Moses, you know, about taking off your sandals, you're on sacred ground. And I brought with me my old uh, St. Joseph Missalette, which uh, has the, the Latin and the English uh, side by side, because in the old days, you know, people didn't understand Latin, even though the Mass was in Latin, so we had this book which uh, had the Latin on one side, the left side, and on the right side was the English. And uh, what, we, what we later used in our creed, uh, I mean, in regards to that line I just read, we said in English, begotten, not made, of one and being with the Father by whom things were, all things were made. But in Latin, it, it read like this, uh, and it, just to show you that it, it did, uh, was used. Genitum uh, non factum, consubstantialum patri per conium omni facta sunt, which is essentially the same thing. But we did have it many years ago, and it was in 2010. Uh, that they decided to put consubstantial back into the creed. And they also, uh, you know, for Mary's birth of Jesus, uh, uh, you know, instead of saying by the power of the Holy Spirit, he, he was, that he was incarnate, and born of flesh in Mary. In this section I want to relate the ways in which I consider Jesus to be a word of God from Scripture, which is an important basis for my presentation Jesus, in his preaching, emphasized the intent of an individual's heart um, as the moral and ethical guide for man's actions. About oaths, do not take, take a false oath, but make good to the Lord all that you vow. Let your yes and your no mean exactly that. Anything more is from the evil one. And I think that's one of the problems we have today is that not a lot of people really stand by their word. And uh, I don't know how your experience is, but my experience is every time you're given something, what do you have to do when you're given a piece of paper? Please sign here that you got this piece of paper. You know, it's always, because you say, well, I never got this paper. If people say, oh, yes, I gave it to you, you know, and, and people will lie. And, and I think, you know, one of the sad things about, you know, especially in the area of marriage, is that, you know, uh, you take uh, vows of unconditional love at the altar, you know, that you will love each other 
for better or for worse, for richer or poorer. Uh, I was an accountant. I know Ernie's an accountant. And we accountants kind of talk in those terms. You know, we, we compute variances of performance. And you know, what are the, the variances, better or worse? <laughs> or, uh, to always in extremes. So, uh, so that, in a way, you know, Jesus said, that mean, you know, let your words mean what you say. And then teaching about adultery, resolving to reform oneself. Uh, everyone who looked, he said, everyone who looks at a woman with lust or has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye or your right hand causes you to sin, he says, uh, cut it off, throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell, Gehenna. This comes out of Matthew. This line of thought aligns with those in rehab from addiction and say how difficult it is to break a habit, especially a bad habit, without well, taking some radical recovery steps. Notice, too, how often Jesus makes references to the heart in other parts of the scripture. In regards to almsgiving, but when you give alms, do not blow the trumpet, brag, so that your almsgiving, do your almsgiving in secret, and your Father who sees into your heart will, in secret will repay you. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Do it in secret. Uh, uh, came out of the readings uh, for Ash Wednesday. Other times Jesus preached about how to deal with our neighbors and enemies. The golden rule, they quote to Matthew, Matthew, do not do unto others whatever you would have them do to you. In judging others, stop judging that you may not be judged. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? First remove the wooden beam from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. In other words, we should be respectful of each other and not nitpick or point fingers at one another. Teaching about anger. If you bring your gift to the altar and then recall that your brother has anything against you, Leave your gift there at the altar. Go first and be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Dealing with enemies, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For if you only love those who, that love you, what recompense will you have from your heavenly Father? Do not the tax collectors do the same? <laughs> and I, I have to say something here about the situation in the Middle East. They, you know, they constantly have uh, ongoing war uh, between uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis. And I think one of the problems is, is that, they, that they do not have enough of the Christian influence. In fact, I've heard stories where they bring kids over here to America to see how we all can get along more or less uh, in harmony, even though we are of different religious backgrounds. And they try to influence them and send them back there so that, you know, they can uh, carry out on the same uh, feeling and uh, try and develop more uh, acceptance of each other. And I think that's a wonderful thing, but, uh, you know, that's a characteristic, I think, of. You know, even though you, you may talk about a lot about, you know, people don't have religion or religion's overstressed or, you know, we should have a separation of church and state. But yeah. at the same time, I think, that, you know, overall in America, I think there is a certain uh, feeling of re religiosity uh, that carries into our daily lives and I think enables us to get along without, you know, uh, always being... Uh, uh, set off against each other with guns and knives wanting to do each other in. And uh, unfortunately, the, they, see, in, uh, in Israel and in Palestine, you know, they, well, they are, there is Islam, uh, uh, Islamic faith or whatever, you know, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And, uh, and I think, you know, what Jesus was saying to, to the people was that, you know, you, you can have those positions, but uh, you're never, you're never going to be able to live with each other. So until you, you know, he says, uh, beat the swords into plowshares. Uh, so that's uh, some food for thought. So teaching about the proper use of wealth from the Beatitudes, Jesus says, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." 
Uh, give to the one who asks of you. Do not turn your back on the one who wants to borrow. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and, and material possessions. He calls it mammon in the scripture. That comes out of Matthew. Uh, so, uh, one of the things I think is often misconstrued is, you know, we, we hear about religious taking the the, there's three vows that religious take in their religious lives. Po chastity, poverty, and obedience. And, you know, the, the thing I think when we hear about poverty, we always think of dirt poor. And I don't, I don't think that was ever really the intention. I think that I like the one that Matthew uses, blessed are the poor in spirit. I, and, and, and it's this sense, and, and he, and he kind of... Uh, Get it from the people, you know, like, like the uh, um, the rich people in our country that uh, practice philanthropy. Uh, they're willing to, you know, Warren Buffett, uh, and and they're willing to share the wealth. And I, and I think that's the main thing is that, you know, uh, I guess in the churches they they preach that you should look at your wealth, your privilege, as a gift, and that your gift is to be shared with others in need. And I. And I think that that uh, that is what uh, I think is the main thrust of that beatitude. And there's other beatitudes: blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers. Goes on. Uh, but at any rate, uh, those uh, these are things that I think Jesus was trying to convey to us to lead a moral life and a righteous life here on earth. Observance of Jewish rules and laws. In Matthew, Jesus challenged the need for fasting as a sign of mourning and that disciples should rejoice because of his presence with them. Jesus said that as a son of man, he was also the Lord of the Sabbath and that his disciples were empowered by him to pick the heads of grain and eat them on the Sabbath. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill and later says that Jesus came not to bring peace, but to create controversy and division among men and women about following him. You know, there, there's this line that, you know, he says, I came to set uh, a father against son, a daughter against mother, and so on. And uh, I think his words were uh, kind of upsetting, you know, uh, especially, you know, about giving up your wealth and... Uh, pick up your cross and follow him and things like that, uh, to follow in his footsteps. Uh, but the thing is, uh, is that, you know, I think in a way, that in regards to what I said about the Sabbath here, is that Jesus wanted to convey, there's, a, there's something that it, it said in Scripture that I didn't quote here, but it, 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 in talking uh, uh, with the, uh, the Pharisees, the upper crust of the Jewish people, you know, he, he comes out and he says, uh, the Sabbath was, uh, was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. And I, I think that's an important point. I remember I had a girlfriend that used to go over on Saturday, Sabbath day, to a, and he had, she had Jewish friends. And she would go in there and they'd be sitting on the couch and they had a nice TV set. But the, the children in the house could not turn on the TV set because it was the Sabbath for my friend. So my friend had to go, because she was a Gentile, she could turn on the TV. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of Jewish laws, you know, about how far you can walk on the Sabbath and things like that. And I, and I think in a way, you know, uh, Jesus, you know, in a gentle way, I, I think he tried to, to you know, debunk that and, you know, and more or less was speaking, you know, because he was from God, that he was trying to convey to the people of the time that what God felt was most important, you know, uh, in your life, you know, and, and there's a lot of Jewish laws, as any of our Jewish brethren know, that they have to observe. Uh, of course, one of them uh, is you, know, you don't eat pig or pork, and because of it's unclean. But you know, modern pig is is a little better product than it was. In, Days pass, and I guess, you know, the, I remember in biology they said, you know, if you eat unclean pork, 
you may get uh, trichinosis, which is tapeworm, I guess. So the thing is, is I, I, I worked for uh, a company that was owned by a, a, a Jewish family, and I was always amazed that we had salesmen that would get sent out to get ham and uh, cheese for sandwiches on Friday. <laughs> I could never understand. I don't know if ham had a special uh, grading privilege versus the rest of the pig or what, but it always amazed me. So at any rate, the, uh, in the 12th day of Christmas, which I was mentioning that earlier, the visit of the Magi, they came from the East. You know, we have the ham, we be three kings, the glory and our bearing gifts. We traverse the fire, following yonder star. They brought three gifts, gold for the king, frankincense for worshiping and praising God on high, and myrrh, a bitter perfume, predicting the babe's future suffering and death. So this concludes my presentation about earthly significance about Jesus' birth. The rest of the story requires a leap of faith to embrace Jesus in the road uh, to his heavenly kingdom and our personal salvation in the afterlife. This part requires full commitment spiritually of the heart to the words of the gospel and scripture. The same level of commitment that you get feeding your bodies while I deliver this presentation. And the reason why I use uh, commitment uh, is that, you know, uh, in, in the Catholic Church, after the priest has consecrated what we say, ordinary forms of wine and bread. They really do, in, in church's language, become the real presence of Christ. And I think when we take communion, we are making a commitment that, to living the Christian life. Much like, you know, when you have a meal, you're making a commitment to your body that you will supply it with the uh, minerals and nutrients that it needs to, uh, for continued existence on earth. Now, many in attendance at this presentation view scripture with a, a, a very uh, skeptical eye as a document contrived by church leaders from long ago. In a human way, their views may seem legitimate. As you may have already inferred from my talk tonight, that I totally support and accept the readings of the Bible as the inspired word of God. Bible is an acronym that a priest once used in a sermon. It stands for basic information before leaving Earth. <laughs> before I conclude, I, want, I would like to make a few comments on the origin of Scripture included in the Bible, from which I heavily quoted throughout this presentation so far. I felt this step necessary for some here in attendance tonight. <clears throat> the Gospel for the second Sunday of Easter, which is written by John, tells the story of how Thomas, the doubter, came to believe in the risen Lord. The story states that Thomas was not present when Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection. When Thomas came later, the disciples did not convince him that Jesus really appeared to them. Thomas knew that Jesus had just died on the cross. So Thomas utters this often quoted line, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger into those nail marks, and put my hands into his side where Jesus had been pierced by the centurion upon his death with the lamps, I will not believe. So about a week later, Jesus appeared again, and this time Thomas was present. Jesus invites him. Thomas, uh, do what you said you would do. And, you know, in, in business, we, uh, we see, I don't know, I, I saw these letters written out, uh, and they are D W Y S Y W D, which stands for "Do what you said you would do." Uh, you know, it's sort of a commitment uh, to taking action. And so we get this confession from Thomas, "My Lord and my God." Jesus responds, "Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed, namely us." John ends the passage with this remarkable statement to us today. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and through this belief have life in his name. There are many sources in my library at home about how the sacred scriptures contained in the Bible came about. 
The one source I would recommend for further reading on this topic is a book, Where We Got Our Bible, Our Debt to the Catholic Church, uh, written by Right Reverend Henry G. Graham in 1911. And I have a copy that's in its 22nd printing. That's the little green book here that I got if you want to look at it later. Uh, this booklet, the one source that I do like uh, is, is one that I got from Ligori Publications in 1999. Well, it was printed in 19, I, I'm not sure, I think I got it in the year 2000. <coughs> Understanding the, the Christian Scriptures. And this booklet has four main sections, how the scriptures were shaped by history, the development of the New Testament, the writing of the Gospels, and the real Jesus. It is easy, an easy read, it can give you more insight into the issue of how the short sayings of Jesus were captured and combined as in the Beatitudes, which was given uh, during the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew, and the use of parables as a teaching tool of Jesus to emphasize that there is a kingdom of heaven in the afterlife worth striving for and telling us what is required of our earthly lives to obtain it. Now, among those requirements are charitable actions called works of mercy by which we come to aid our neighbor in his, his or her spiritual life and bodily necessities. This uh, is quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Part 3, and it's in section 2447. I have a page number 648. Um, the corporal works of mercy consist of giving alms to the poor, the needy, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, clothing the naked, visiting the sick or in prison, and burying the dead. The spiritual works of mercy include instructing, advising, counseling, or consoling, comforting along with forgiving, and bearing wrongs patiently. Now, even though some of you may not say, you know, all right, that you're, you're, uh, you're aligned with a particular faith, but I, I think in a way that if you do some of these corporal works of mercy that I, uh, uh, or the spiritual works of mercy uh, during your lifetime, I, I think, you know, that, you know, it counts uh, in your afterlife. Uh, you know, there's often a contention, I noticed, you know, do we really have a spirit? You know, we're, uh, we're more or less, we think of ourselves only as body, uh, bodies without souls. And I have it here in my notes, if I can find it. <laughs> uh, a beautiful passage uh, that was written by a, a fella by the name of George Sanders. Um, he's, a, 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 he's just turned 56 years old, and he's a recipient of the MacArthur's Genius uh, Grant. Uh, and he's a writer of American short stories. Oh boy. And what he said here was the luminous part of you uh, that exists beyond personality, if you will, your soul, is as bright and shining as any that has ever been. Clear away everything that keeps you separate from the secret of luminous place. Believe it exists. Come to know it better and nurture it and share its fruits tirelessly. And, you know, uh, one of the things I often challenge, you know, with people is that uh, we we know we, uh, that we can account for ourselves physically. Uh, you know, if we get 23 chromosomes from our, each of our parents, 46, well, you know, we combine those to become our, our person, you know, in the physical sense. But exactly where do we get uh, the person that exists within us? Uh, you know, uh, Thomas Merton talks about a true self and a false self. False selves usually are external selves. The true self, I think he's referring to the soul, even though he doesn't say it, is the part that, you know, is our life energy source to our bodies. And, you know, we all know we've, we've experienced the death of someone, and we know when someone dies that something isn't there that was there before. And I believe that it's the soul, and the soul 
will go on forever. Source criticism is addressed on how a single source uh, called Q, the German word, was vetted to the synoptic gospel, synoptic meaning seen together. The gospels were combined into a three-year lectionary cycle that was born out of Vatican II. Year A readings, uh, which was in 2014, covered the Gospel of Matthew. Year B, which we currently cover in 2015, is the Gospel of Mark and a portion of John. And in year 16, we will read Luke. The cycles all start with the first Sunday of Advent, and the readings taken together cover most of the Bible as it relates to the Word of God. Uh, just for your information, tomorrow is Sunday the 21st of December, the fourth Sunday of Advent, and uh, the Gospel reading uh, will be the, uh, the Annunciation. And incidentally, the Annunciation was celebrated in the Catholic Church calendar on March 25th, nine months ago, in anticipation of Christmas to this week. And and uh, that uh, so you know there's a long recognition in the church uh, of the connection of the readings. The topic of the real Jesus is best covered in the Creed book in chapter eight, uh, which was uh, in the quest for the historical Jesus is referenced in the line of, from the Nicene Creed. For I think he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, the author. Uh, Bernard Martha, the, the Franciscan, references Albert Schweitzer's provocative turn of the 20th century book, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, in which Schweitzer took for granted, uh, as well as, as most French scholars do, the historical evidence that around 2,000 years ago, there lived a Jew named Jesus, who was crucified during the time when Pontius Pilate was procurator in Palestine. This happened about uh, in A.D. 2636, or uh, if you like using the Jewish years, between the years 3786 and 3796. Anno Domino, uh, which means in the year of the Lord, uh, was attributed uh, being started by, for use by a Roman monk named Dionysus the Little, who lived about 500, who had the habit uh, of custom dating everything in relationship to the birth of Jesus. And uh, I have uh, here, I kept a little thing that I used in one of my earlier talks about how long the Jews waited for a Messiah. Well, at least in terms of the promise to Abraham and going forward uh, to the time of Jesus' birth. And the way I calculated is now we are in the Jewish year of 5775, and we're next year, we'll, you know, after the new year, we'll be in the Christian year of 2015. So the time of the Old Testament from the prophecy of Abraham to the time that Jesus was born was 3,760 years. And somehow, I, I don't like B.C. Uh, because of the fact that it's a number line deal where, you know, Jesus' birth is zero, and then you got to go minus numbers in and you get all screwed up between the, and I'd rather stick with the Jewish here because it's a little easier to relate to them. <laughs> but anyway, on page 33 of this chapter, Bernard goes into detail of how 19th century biblical criticism helped to provide a positive insight between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. He states that the biblical scholars worked hard in New Testament studies to develop the historical method by giving convincing arguments for a two-source theory relying on the Gospel of Mark and the primitive source Q, which I mentioned earlier. All four Gospel writers dramatized Pontius Pilate's role in the passion and death of Jesus, and there is reason to believe that the narrative accurately described the sequence of events. The, the reason why, in, 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 if you ever read the Creed, there are only two people mentioned. One is Mary, the mother of God, how she conceived uh, by the Holy Spirit and bore a son. And the other one is Pontius Pilate. And, you know, uh, I think well, the, the reference is necessary because of the fact that, you know, you're talking about a guy that existed, but how do we know he really existed? You know, there's a lot of doubt and things like that. And I, and I, and I think, you know, for purposes of clarity, that they included Pontius Pilate to, so that 
you know, at least we, you know, in terms of historical matter, that it would actually peg Christ's real existence on this earth. For further reading, if you are interested in this topic on scripture, I recommend reading the Dogmatic Constitution and Divine Revolution, issued by Pope Paul VI in 1965. It included the documents of Vatican II and in the New American uh, Bible 2006 and 2007. Chapters include Revelation itself, Handing on Divine Revelation, Sacred Scriptures, its inspiration and divine integration, chapters on the Old and New Testaments and Sacred Scriptures in the life of the Church. Also in the New American Bible, there's a 15-page section on the origin, inspiration, and history of the Bible. And also in the Creed, uh, chapter 17, there's a section on the inspired word. And starting on page 76 in that section, there's a, a, a title, a section titled Safeguarding the Message, in which there's a long discussion in canonizing the scriptures. So that essentially is the end of my formal presentation. And uh, I have one more thing I want to do with you uh, before I conclude. And, and, and uh, I want to play uh, the Handel's uh, Hallelujah Chorus from Messiah, which I have on my the CD I was using earlier, uh, which was recorded from St. Gregory's, the great uh, church in Chicago, which isn't far from here. They're on uh, uh, Bryn, uh, Bryn, uh, yeah, Mawr, just uh, west of Ashland. I thought it was important to give you a little Christmas music. <laughs>
don't suppose they get tears in his eyes. <laughs> I do. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes, uh, now you're open to the question. Yes, right. yes. Uh, All right, I ain't got the first uh, one. Right. Um, oh. I got well, the first one. First. Oh. All right. Well, Doug, you just, you just spoke yeah. for about an hour. What was the main purpose of your speech? <laughs> I gave it in the beginning, you know, about how Jesus relates to our lives here on earth. You know, uh, he told us how to lead the moral life and the things that we should do, how we should handle with each other. Did you miss that? No, yes, no I yes. didn't miss it, but it, it certainly uh, got kind of boring for a while. So. Well, it was boring for you. I don't know about others. Okay, Carl Schwepp. Uh, no, in the at some point in your speech, you had brought up the uh, Israel-Palestinian uh, conflict. Yeah. And, and you made some point about uh, they would be better off if they learned something about Christianity. But <laughs> it's like, in your book, it says that Alex will have like, no God uh, before, or something you know, to that effect about having no other God. So isn't that the basis for conflict with other religions and, and you know, and we've been fighting about this for centuries, doesn't that cause war? Uh, well, you know, that's often said, you know, that, you know, religion has caused more wars, but at the same time, there's a lot of underpinning issues that are talked about, you know, economic uh, boundaries, things like that, that add to, to the mix. But at the, si at the same time, you know, I, I, I think the, the point I was trying to get at was that, you know, you got to have some level of tolerance, you know. Yeah, you probably justified it, you know, if you get punched, uh, punch somebody else back and, and then, you know, your friends join in and their friends join in and you got a real row going and, but at the same time, you know, I, I think that, you know, to settle an argument, you got to back off, you know, it's like the Hatfields and McCoys, I guess they shot each, at each other for, for years and, 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 you know, I don't know how they, exactly how they settled it. But you get a little tired of the killing after a while, and the fighting, and uh, and, I, and I think that you know, I think Jesus was trying to just show people the, how to end their uh, conflicts a little easier and sooner. Uh, let's see, uh, Gene Horker, and then Dave. Uh, I'm a little weak on my Catholic theology, but you, you're talking about the birth of Jesus. And my recollection is that Catholics believe, or once believed, that uh, Joseph was not the father of Jesus, that God was the father of Jesus. In other words, that Mary was a virgin. Do you believe that? I've got your cheesecake. Well, that, you know, what you bring up is exactly what they bring out. Uh, in the, uh, the creed that we say on Sunday, uh, I'll give you the exact wording uh, of how it, it's worded. Uh, this is beyond the point where it talks about how Jesus is connected with the Father consubstantially today. And it says, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. So uh, in the scripture it says the Holy Spirit uh, would overshadow Mary. So uh, essentially through a mysterious way uh, God imparted, you know, took a part of himself, the Godhead I guess you'd say, uh, and implanted himself into a woman because all men have to be born of women. All of us are and uh, became man and you know his mission in life was to uh, bring the word of God uh, as God wanted us to be instructed to us you know we uh, we have this thing you know uh, about you know the, uh, uh, the snake uh, I can't even think of it now uh, the Terminator movies you know how he just comes out of nowhere and he's a man and he he knows his mission is to save the kid uh, because he, he's going to be able to ward off, uh, ward off you know, future wars or whatever. Uh, 
if you those of you have seen the movies. And uh, so we always have, and even in today's uh, film environment, we always have people coming into the world from other worlds. And, and so, you know, I, I don't know if they substantiate, you know, what exactly uh, happened uh, to us in, in terms of the person of Jesus, uh, but, you know, uh, from the historical record, that is how he is preached uh, by the church. All right, then. Thank you. All right. Let me warn you that my question is going to be somewhat smart how you yeah, it. Now, you seem to feel that... Can't hear you. Can't hear you. You seem to feel that both sides in the Middle East could benefit from a more Christian spirit. Yeah. But how are they to do this when Christianity itself has not resolved all of its inter denominational fights and frequently resorts to violence to settle some of those. Uh, when you say violence, violence in what respect? Are you talking about the, the, the way the, the Irish uh, over there in Ireland, That's the, just one example. the Protestants and the Catholics, and there, had, was a, the there was a time where in, even in England there was a persecution of Protestants and Catholics because of the division of faith. Well, I have to and say, though, that, between the pro different Protestants but I have to say one of the problems in Ireland over there is more than just a matter of faith. It's, a, it's an issue that, uh, <clears throat> that they had over that the Irish Protestants were the wealthy noblemen that ruled the land, and the, uh, the Irish Catholics were like the peasants, subject to the rule of, of the wealthy landowners. And they didn't get along very well. You know, they didn't share the wealth. They had a, a, you know, a lot of uh, <coughs> power uh, manipulation, things like that. So you know, it, it was more than religion. Now, what, what, what I guess what I'm trying to get at, in terms of Palestinian uh, peace in the West Bank and things like that, is uh, for those people, you know, to, to kind of. Give each other a, a little distance, a little, you know, uh, a little benefit of the doubt, a little, you know, freedom. You know, there, there's too much overreaction. There's, you know, you kill one person and then 50 people have to die because that one person died, and then that, then they, then the other side gets mad because 50 people died and it's honored, and you know they're just going at each other crazily, and we've had wars, uh, you know, two big world wars, and I think. You know, through the United Nations, as perfect as it is, I think they have tried to maintain worldwide peace at some level under what we experienced in World War I and World War II. All right. All right. Yo, know, Steve. So, so this, is, this is a question relating to the previous question and answer. And you as a Catholic, can you tell me, is, is the God of... The, the, the Catholics or the Bible, the same God as Allah, the same God that's in the Torah. Are all three really, aren't we all three religions talking to the same God, the one and only God? In, as a Catholic, what, what do you say well, about that? Well, yeah, I, I agree uh, that uh, there is, you know, one God. Well, because we talk about a Godhead, three persons and one God. We talk about God the Creator, God the Father. Then we have God the Son, the Word of God made flesh, and then we have the Holy Spirit, which the Church swears uh, still uh, roams through the earth, uh, the world, uh, changing the minds of men, inspiring them to do better things, inspired me to come and talk to you guys. <laughs> uh, I, I really think, you know, uh, so I really believe in inspiration, and I think a lot of people, uh, human mankind has benefited uh, from people's belief that they could do better things for man. And uh, even uh, among, uh, you know, if you ever saw the movie Gandhi, the movie, Gandhi was not Catholic, he was a Hindu. But at any rate, there was a scene in the movie where one guy comes to him, where he comes to him, he hit and said, uh, Mahatma, I, I, I killed a Muslim boy, and he was, the guy was Hindu. I don't know if you remember the scene in the movie. They played it on TV. Well, next time it plays on TV, watch it. So he comes to Muhammad and says, I need forgiveness. I killed I kill a Muslim boy. He was only 12 years old. Please forgive me. And Gandhi said, I cannot forgive you. And uh, he said, but please, I, I, need, I need to do something. I feel overwhelmed with 
pity and grief that I did this terrible thing because you know, they were the Muslims and the Hindus were fighting each other. You know, this was '47 when the the, the uh, India was partitioned, and uh, so then Handi said the most fantastic thing I ever heard uh, said. He said, "Okay, you want forgiveness? This is what you are to do. You are to go and find another Muslim boy who is an orphan, take him to your home." and raise them as your own. Now, if that doesn't sound like something that would come out of the mouth of Jesus, sure. I don't know. So, in a way, there's opportunities in the, all our <coughs> religions to do, you know, that kind of uh, work uh, with each other. Yeah, I have a question. And, oh, uh, yeah, my question is, uh, one of the prophets, I think it was Jeremiah, but I'm Speak not up. sure now, uh, said, <laughs> yeah. what does the no, Lord no, no. require of you but to do mercy, and to do justice, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? How does Jesus do this for us? Well... Well, I, I think, you know, in what I quoted in, in the talk, I mean, sort of did it in length, uh, you know, he talks about loving your neighbor as yourself, uh, uh, putting up, uh, uh, forbearing with each other. He says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Um, the, you know, to your courage to bring about peace in the world, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, and then, you know, blessed are you for enduring persecution when others are persecuting because of me. So, uh, you know, he more or less says the same thing, not in the exact words, but I think to that uh, effect in the end. Yeah, well, did he give us an example of this? Well. Uh, how is he doing justice, uh, loving mercy, and walking humbly with his God? Well, uh, well, uh, you know, the, the thing is, okay, for example, uh, we have a situation where the woman uh, was a sinner, and they were ready to cast stones at her. And, 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 and she, she had violated the law, you know, I guess prostitution or whatever. And, and Jesus comes to them and he says to the group that's ready to stone her, you know, let you who are, who are without sin cast the first stone. Well, all of them knew they had committed sin at some time in their life, and they, and they dropped their stones and left, and then he said to the woman, you know, uh, I condemn you neither, but go forward and sin no more. That's a good one, Brown. That's a good one, Brown. You got to admit it. <laughs> uh, Charles? Yeah, uh, Doug, isn't it true that none of the Bethlehem story and his birth and the donkeys and all this, absolutely none of that is historically true or inaccurate? And it actually describes the events about of another god called Mithra. I, I don't know about conspiracy theory. About that, uh, uh, but I've got a question for uh, Charles. Right, but but the, you why, Charles. why is it only two of the Gospels record the Bethlehem story, and not all four? Give it such a big event. Well. Uh, uh, John, you know, he starts out his gospel uh, a little different way from the others, I grant you. Uh, you know, he starts, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and he became flesh, and he came unto his own, and his own rejected him, and received him not. Uh, that That's true. Uh, but as far as, you know, Luke's story, I mean, uh, there, probably, there apparently was a, a census at that time. Like, Augustus Caesar uh, wanted a sense of the whole world. Mary and Joseph are going out uh, to partake in that census. They, they're out of town. They have no place, and it was time for Mary to deliver. And, you know, we, and they have the story that she gave birth in a stable. Um, and then the shepherds appeared. Now, as far as when, it, when did the birth really take place? 
it, it seems like it, you know it happened more in the spring uh, than uh, than at this time of the year because it's that time of the year that the shepherds are out with their sheep because the, the sheep are giving birth to the lambs, so they have to protect them from the wolves. Now, at the same time, one thing you have to realize is that you know, I think in terms of the uh, the church calendar uh, that you having a birth so close to Easter, uh, they in fact in the early part of Christianity they did not really celebrate Christmas the way we do today. They didn't do that until the year 300 A.D. So, uh, so at that time, you know, there was a lot of persecution in the church, and they they kind of had underground celebrations for Jesus on the winter solstice, which is this time of year. So I guess when the church came out from persecution, they decided uh, that they would make this day, uh, December 25th, the day of Christmas. And we have 12 days of Christmas, by the way. And nobody, everyone thinks Christmas ends on Christmas Day. You know, we have the song, the 12 days of Christmas. But I would test anyone and say, what are the, when did the 12 days take place? It seems like everyone thinks Christmas is the 12th day, and there's no, I've seen, it happened where someone in the neighborhood on December 26th went and threw the Christmas tree out. <laughs> as if it's over. But we have a whole season of Christmas. In fact, I think it would do people well not to get so hung up and getting everything ready for the 25th because we have you know, like three weeks of, in the church calendar, I have one here. Uh, Christmas doesn't really end until mid-January with the baptism of the Lord according to the current calendar we use. So, in a lot of times, places it ends with the Epiphany, the three wise men showing up, you know, even though it was two years after Jesus left. But at any rate, uh, you know, it all ties in with the Christmas season, and I think we should go back to celebrating the Christmas season rather than just Christmas Day. But at any rate, uh, it, the story goes that he was born of uh, lean, lean estate, so uh, that's... That's the story, and I, we have nothing more. Uh, we accepted that he was born. That's the, the key thing. He was not born into into royal majesty. I'm oh, sure. you don't know nothing. It all comes <laughs> out. <laughs> out. <laughs> I tell you how it all. Oh, don't listen to Brown. Don't listen to Brown. <laughs> <laughs> He's you the Antichrist. Yeah. John the Baptist Day is what June twenty fourth, right? Yeah, yeah a said. few days after uh, the uh, yes. sol solstice, yes, the summer solstice. And the Baptist day. Yeah, and you have, but after that, uh, you know, the days visibly become shorter. Well, with... December 25th, four days after uh, the, uh, winter the solstice. solstice, the winter solstice, and the days visibly become longer, and the light is coming into the world. And so that's why John the Baptist gets the decreasing, and and the and Jesus gets. The increasing, aha, uh -huh. it's, it's all very poetic. Okay. Yes. Uh, John very the good. Baptist, in, in the first chapter of the fourth gospel, says, "I must, he must increase, but I decrease." Right, and they were cousins. Uh, yes, through their mothers. Well, so so we're told. Okay, uh, Charlie. Yeah, in the gospels they say there was a. A star in Bethlehem, but none of the astronomers have seemingly been able to identify this event. Uh, well, there's uh, no historical record. I don't really have an answer, but I remember being down at the Adler Planetarium yeah, in right. the 80s, and they did some kind of show where they tried to show you know, that there was a star over Bethlehem. They set the old planetarium ceiling back in time, and yeah, I saw that. there was some kind of astronomy event that coincided with the birth of Jesus uh, but at any rate uh, you know it was a, a great moment to be noted I guess
Where are all our atheists tonight? Yeah. Uh, I think they're all around here, right? right okay. Here. Uh, they're not here. What is, they're not here right? You've got to confound him with the question. Go ahead. Stay. Okay, you got this. Right. Yeah, it's getting to be rebuttal time. All right, David. David Travis. Are you going to do rebuttal now? No. Not yet. You got a question? I got I'm a question. ready for the rebuttal. Oh, okay. oh, 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 uh, I, I, I really don't know the whole story. Borrowed. Let's not say stolen. Let's say borrowed. <laughs> I don't know the whole story. I mean, we had, you know, the Tannenbaum, the Christmas tree, Christmas lights. You know, like uh, Ram was, Ram was saying that, you know, the summer solstice is the rebirth of the sun. It's the darkest day of the year. And then from days forth, it gets brighter. Uh, there's a lot of, re maybe a lot of Christmas tradition tied up in that. Uh, we have the Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, uh, in which, you know, we, we see the conversion of a stingy old man into a, a very loving person after being visited by, you know, the three ghosts. And God bless us. Uh, yeah, and, and it kind of tied in, some of us say it tied in with experiences in Dickens' life. So, uh, we... So there, you know, and, and then we have Santa Claus. Uh, we have St. Nicholas Day on the 6th. Where, and then we get to Santa Claus by taking St. Nicholas and dropping the Nick part to Claus. And in English, they, they, instead of K, they use C. And you get Santa Claus. And he's in the night before Christmas. And Santa, I mean, nobody wants Santa Claus to die. Yes, there is a Santa Claus. Yes, there is Jesus. Yes, there is God. Yes, there is Christian charity. Yes, there is a Salvation Army. Salvation Army? All right. Salvation Army. Salvation Army. Are you going to uh, make a rebuttal? Or? or do we still have questions or no? Well, I don't well, know. Well, no. Let's take one more well, question. You've got yeah, a hot one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Doug, I, you know, I don't really know your age much, but uh, were you around, were you a, a practicing Christian before Vatican II? And if so, could you give a few words about the changes? You spoke briefly on that, but some of the changes uh, from Vatican II. Well, okay, well, yeah, prior, prior to Vatican II, I was an altar boy. I, I, I became an altar boy in 1958. Vatican II took place in the early 60s. I saw the change where I had to learn Latin. Uh, when we sat at the cathedral, we said, read our breast and say, main culpa, may maxima culpa. Uh, today we say, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Uh, we put masses in the vernacular and we face the altar. Uh, the priest in those days faced the wall. And we had to guess what he was doing. We had to guess what he was saying. No, we you talk Latin anymore. Uh, so it was a great thing. And then the other thing, too, is, is with Vatican II, there's more participation by the laity in the Mass rather than everyone sitting there uh, kneeling and talking and uh, fumbling their beads. Uh, saying the Rosary, you know, there's active participation. You can understand what the priest is doing, saying, well, you can see what he's doing. And also, there's a lot of lay participation in the Mass, yeah. and one thing position I had, I was a lector, I was reading the scriptures. That's why I know them so well. Thank you. Yeah. All okay. right. Is that All right. Now let's go to rebuttals. Oh, you better watch it. Here comes the first of the lions. Mm. Ah. <laughs> Here comes the lightning. Good evening. Good evening. Where's the fire exit? There is a... Uh, a story that uh, Christianity was uh, born in the Middle East and was taken to Greece where it became a philosophy and where uh, later it was taken to uh, Rome and became a religion and spread throughout Europe and became a culture and that it was taken to America 
where it became big business. Uh, the uh, paper that I was given to look at here said that uh, uh, Jesus, Mary's boy child, on, born on Christmas Day uh, to his followers who do you say I am. There was never anything brought up about that. What's more, though, I want to point out that this is very misleading because any Catholic priest will tell you that the 25th of December is not the day that Jesus was born. That's a day that was later declared to be the day that they would use. Uh, but that, uh, uh, our speaker kept insisting and saying he was born on Christmas Day. Well, that's absolutely a myth. Uh, I um, have been told that uh, for Easter, the merchants sell a lot of clothing, uh, suits and pants and shoes and so forth, and that... Uh, after Easter, things get a little tough, and that uh, during the year, things don't go so well. And then around graduation, the, um, the merchants sell a little bit because people need clothes to uh, do their graduating in and so forth. But that uh, when it gets to be around the end of October, the beginning of November, the Jewish merchants all get together and sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. Blasphemy! <laughs> I uh, also want to point out that, uh, uh, oh, good Lord. that uh, this uh, waterboarding and all the torture that they've used at Gitmo to make these people confess were totally unnecessary. Uh, if you want any of these um, uh, terrorists or whatever to uh, confess, it's only necessary to lock them in a room and continuously play Christmas music. <laughs> And uh, as to the, uh, our speaker mentioning that uh, there were certain Jews who would uh, send out for ham <laughs> and pork chops and so forth, their hypocrisy, which is what that was, uh, only points up their hypocrisy, <laughs> certainly not the hypocrisy of all Jews. So I think that might clear up a misconception that our speaker had when he said he wondered about that. <laughs> uh, the apostle, uh, uh, Saul, later known as the Apostle, who was around some 60 or 80 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, went around and gathered up all of the legends and uh, verbal uh, things that were handed down about Jesus. There was nothing in writing. He took all those sayings and so forth and put them in writing. And then he uh, uh, arranged it the way he wanted it. And this is the so-called New Testament. Uh, the uh, Jewish Bible, what is known as the Old Testament, was in writing for probably 1,000, 1,500 years before all of that. So in other words, the Jews have the documentation. The Christians have to rely on what uh, the Apostle Paul put together and wrote to suit his own purposes. Uh, and if asked, Jesus would have told you he is a Jew. Uh, Christianity, uh, okay, 
and Jesus would have told you that he was a Jew. Uh, so that's what I have to say. Shalom! Shalom, brother! Bravo! Watch, the, you're, you're, you're blocking his view there. Dude. Okay, uh, give me a one minute warning, please. Uh, uh, this was a very interesting uh, talk. I enjoyed it. Maybe five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, give me a one minute warning, please. Uh, this is a very interesting talk. Um, I was a Catholic as a boy till I was 21. I was slow. I'm still recovering. Uh, I, uh, I have a lot of Catholic friends, and I would say uh, the Catholic uh, friends that I have are mainly in social justice uh, work of some type, and they're wonderful people. They're wonderful people, and most of the Catholics I know are way ahead of their theology. They're, I don't think they believe in a lot of the stuff that uh, I learned when I was a kid. Uh, certainly they don't believe in using, uh, not using birth control. They seem to have gotten over that point, point uh, which was a, uh, that kind of thing was a big thing when I was a kid, thinking about all this uh, stuff. But uh, as a Unitarian Universalist, I don't have to bother with this kind of stuff. Uh, there are a couple good things I got, though. I remember one thing that is a good idea that a lot of Unitarians don't seem to take real seriously is to have a set of standards and hold yourself to them and examine your conscience. I still do that. The rules have changed. The, <laughs> that set of rules is basically not my set of rules. But the set of rules that I go by are probably pretty close to most of the Catholics that I know. Uh, it's just that they've left all that theology, a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of that theology behind. I've uh, seen, and recently I had to go for Jane Adams Senior Caucus a couple of times to talk for about two or three minutes to a Catholic church. It was interesting to see the service. Because uh, the service wasn't that far from the Unitarian Universalist service. Uh, in fact, people uh, during the service, I saw women on the altar. I saw women participating and men, as Doug said. And uh, in part of the, in part of the uh, mass, everybody shook hands with everybody else and said peace. So I think these are... Uh, very, uh, very good things. But the, the theology itself is is uh, something else that pretty much is left behind, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's a great story. I will say that it's a a great story. It's fun to hear uh, Doug talk about it and, uh, and relive that. And the music was great, Doug. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Well, I looked up at the sun, and there was two beams of light coming from the sun. And on one beam walked Jesus Christ, and on the other beam walked Moses. And they proceeded, they proceeded down to a body of water. And the Moses started to walk on the water. And Jesus kept sinking as he kept walking on the water. So Jesus cried out, Moses, how do you do that miracle? He says, you dumb schmuck, walk on the rocks like I do. <laughs> There used to be a guy here called the Leo Zimmer. I don't know how many people remember him. He was a real character. And he used to walk down Rosso Road at night. So he says to the people, he says, do not walk down Rosso Road at night. 
the Moody Bible Institute has Chuck that sees a lone Jew walking, walking down Roosevelt Road and will kidnap him and try to convert him. Says, so don't walk down Roosevelt Road at night. <laughs> True story, huh? Yeah. He was a real character. I think it's Chicago Avenue. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, there used to be a writer. His, his name was uh, Karl Kautsky. And I guess he lived around the 1920s or somewhere around there. And he wrote a book called The Origins of Christianity. And in that book, he quoted um, Josephus, I believe, the, I'm not sure if I'm quoting the name correctly. He was the leading scribe of that period when Jesus lived. And he says he never wrote one word about Jesus in there. There was, there was a lot of uh, scribes going around, a lot of uh, people at that time that were going around saying they were the Savior. Well, at that time, Rome was in decline, and it was losing its empire. And a lot of people, especially in the so-called um, middle classes at that time, which were mostly what they call plebs, which are carpenters, fishermen, and things of that nature, uh, were very disenchanted, and they didn't like the Roman Empire because a lot of their jobs were being taken over by slaves. So they disliked what was going on in the Roman Empire. And that's one of the ways they revolted, is bringing up this thing about the Savior. And of course, um, at that particular time, the Savior wasn't uh, uh, a so-called uh, religious deity or anything like that. but. What, he, what it was essentially, he wanted to save this middle class. And he says, chase all the uh, money changers from the temple. And they just hated, there was a class struggle going on at that time. And once uh, the Christians took over, that is the Roman Empire took over, took over Christianity, uh, <clears throat> What they wanted, essentially, is to mollify these people. So they said, well, your, your good life will come afterwards. You, in other words, you'll have pie in the sky when you die. And it became uh, sort of like uh, a mystery religion, like other mystery religions. But essentially, um, Jesus, what I understand if he ever did live, was more of a revolutionary than anything else, and Rome wanted to pacify any revolutionary, so they put off the good life until after you died. Amen. Amen. Let me go next time. My turn. Okay. All right. Well, excellent you know, rebuttal. Jesus. If he was anybody, he uh, was an organizer. He organized his disciples, and he sent them out two by two where he'd like to go himself. He sent them around uh, the, uh, the areas of Galilee because his disciples were mostly in, in Galileans. And they could speak Galilean Hebrew or Aramaic uh, pretty, pretty good, and they knew the religion of their fellow Jews, uh, and uh, they, what did he ask them to do? He said, uh, to heal the sick, raise the dead, and to cast, cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. Those were the four tasks uh, that they, uh, they were also supposed to preach the kingdom of God. Let God rule you. Well, how do you do that? 
Well, you do mercy, you uh, do justice, and you walk humbly with the Lord your God. Uh, does he put up uh, things about, uh, oh, no Samaritans allowed because they're not really kosher Jews? Uh, no. <coughs> when uh, a Jewish leper is healed and comes back and gives thanks, he says, your faith has made you whole. Your faith. And he's sending him to your priest, obviously a Samaritan priest. You know, it's not a matter. He's not a sectarian or a nationalist in that sense. <laughs> so identify himself. How did he identify himself? He was his father's son. He knows, acknowledged uh, Joseph as his father. Mary acknowledges Joseph as uh, Foster. Uh, Jesus' father. How could you treat uh, your father and me this way uh, when he got lost when he was 12 years old in, in Jerusalem at, uh, at around the temple and got separated from his folks? Uh, it's. Jesus identifies himself with his Father in heaven. Where is the real me? Where do I get what's right and what's wrong? Where do I get a feeling that I am really alive? Where from the powers that give me life, that are life, and am I living, being godly? Well, so he identifies himself with his spiritual father. He identifies himself with the laws of Moses. He says, do the works that, that the teachers of the law tell you to do, but uh, they maybe uh, don't always do at, like they do. And he was a good interpreter of the law, uh, correcting some of the mis misreadings uh, that uh, were current in uh, Israel at that time. Uh, well, if, if you're going to be like Jesus and uh, go around healing lepers. You know, lepers are not appealing people. They're smelly and they're dirty. Um, heal the lepers? Cure the lepers? Oh. Uh, the, and the, the sick, they're away. And they're, they, they, they're, they're sore and they they don't, maybe don't have enough to pay uh, a decent, uh, for, for good nursing or whatever. It takes, it takes time, as uh, Tim Bolger is reminding me, and I'm not going to take any more of your time because I see that Tim wants to say something too. Part two next week. Part two next week, Brian. Come on. My remarks are going to be very brief. This is not really the religion that is practiced around Chicago, Christianity. I mean, most of our religions have to have a little bit of a sense of hope, maybe a little bit of belief, and the unbelievable. So I'm going to do what I consider Chicago's true religion, particularly at this time of year, and that will be this. Good time. Overrated. Now that's a real leap of faith. <laughs> That is a real leap of faith, eh? Bear down, Chicago Bears. The true religion. I'm still going to watch tomorrow.
First of all, I'm, some of what was said reminded me of the comment that Lucy makes in a Charlie Brown Christmas that was shown again on CBS uh, earlier this week. And when she says, don't you know Charlie Christmas is a racket run by a big Eastern commercial syndicate? <laughs> With regard to what I asked about earlier, I wasn't talking only about Ireland. That's just one tiny example. You have the Thirty Years' War. You have the numerous interdenominational quarrels, not only between Catholics and Protestants, but between Protestants and Protestants, and sometimes within individual Protestant denominations. Well, also sometimes between different kinds. Sometimes even between different kinds of Baptists, for just one example. So, I think Christianity needs to bring a little piece into its own house, uh, and, and, as, as well as perhaps offering suggestions elsewhere. With regard to the comments that were made about Jews and pork, I suspect that those people were probably Reformed Jews, which is what I am, and Reformed Judaism traditionally abandoned some such things as the kosher laws, because they were just not consonant with the modern practice of Judaism in the United States in what then was the 19th, later the 20th, and now the 21st centuries. Uh, not everybody, not all Reformed Jews abandoned the kosher laws. Some went back to it. Other Jews never gave, other branches of Judaism never gave it up in the first place. It's very much a matter of individual practice and not, as was alleged, a matter of hypocrisy. We also heard talk about how Joseph is the stepfather of Jesus, and I would disagree with that. I would say rather, I would say rather that most Western Christians and most Eastern ones, including all the members of the Eastern Orthodox churches, practice what's called, I believe, physitism, under which they teach that Jesus had two natures, both human and divine. And that's why it seems to skip back and forth in the New Testament between Jesus having God as the Father and Joseph as the Father. There was a big argument between the uh, people who practice physitism, which is eventually became standard in the church, and other people who argued for monophysitism, that Jesus had only one nature that was divine. And this got to be a big deal in uh, the Eastern, the times of the Eastern Roman Empire in Constantinople, no where there was, where the average Joe in the street took about as much interest in religion as the average Joe in the street here in Chicago takes and who gets elected county assessor. I'm not kidding. And it reached the point where there was violence between Tim, are you time, timing me somewhere? You need to let me know when to stop. <laughs> three minutes. It's a three minute mark right now. All right. And there was violence, and it reached the point where there were riots in the hippodrome between the blues and the greens. One side, one side, one of the chariot teams took the side of monophysitism. One physitism, a riot. Just then the emperor finally had to call off the troops under his best general Belisarius to put it all down. And they turned out they burned down the Church of the Holy Wisdom. That uh, Constantine had built, the one that's there now, was the one that Justinian built to replace the church that the riot had burned down. So the um, rules concerning the church's observance of witness of Judaism uh, were firmly fixed in a 5th century council that was held at Chalcedon in what now is, uh, what now is Turkey. Thank you. Next. Next. Oh, not me. 
Oh, oh, next. oh, oh all right. right. Well, let's we not go. Fight I didn't blend that speed too much, but uh, let's thank our speaker again. Very good. Let's see. Um, I don't know, I'm not going to talk too much about the Judeo-Christian tradition here. Um, we're talking about a small library of books, largely folk tales and poetry and some peculiar rules. The amazing thing is there's lack of consistency among the Old and New Testaments. There's a, it's been recorded about 2,000 internal contradictions because they're compilations. And I wouldn't use them as a guide, certainly not for ethics. Um, it's, it's like the late Lee Hubble said, the scriptures are very forgiving, meaning if you don't like what you find in one location, you can go to another location and find the answer that is more suitable to your, whatever you want. Um, you know, there's, I, I, I'm not going to go on the search of historical Jesus because I abandoned the topic entirely about 10 years ago. I didn't feel any particular need for it. The thing about Christmas, though, um, yeah, as you somewhat hit on it here, they originally didn't have, that they put together, there was no one recording events at the time. And both for Christ and Muhammad, they came after the fact. Um, talk about writing stories after things lived. There were 800 years uh, that elapsed from the time of Moses to the first document that we can find a written account of uh, Moses. So there's no real validity to a lot of these things that you can, if you're going to apply any standard at all. Um, yeah, they started compiling things after, but, and what, with the thing about it, he hit on it a little bit, there were all sorts of debates about the Christ and who he was and his divinity and things like this, and so they came up, the, 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 the Bethlehem story is basically to quiet these arguments, if you wish, or to come up with one answer. Um, there was no census. They said, well, the Messiah, in order to fulfill prophecy, he had to be of the house of David, meaning he would have had to be born like in Bethlehem. Well, how do you get him to Bethlehem when he's not from Bethlehem? He's from, he's from Nazareth another location, right? So they came up and they said, well, he was born, and that that settles the thing. Like, he's, he's uh, okay, now he's in the house of David. Um, the rest of the story, like the star, you weren't considered, um, it was rather important what celestial events took place, either on the day you were born or the day you died. And so there were very stellar events, uh, supposedly like when Caesar died, I, a, a, a comet flew through the sky and even appeared on Roman coins. So that would establish that he had inspiration of the deities and things like this. They took astronomy a lot more seriously than we do today. So things like that. Um, uh, it's a nice story, you know, he's born in the poverty uh, of humble circumstances, much different than um, things like that. It's a good read, it's, but uh, in terms of, that's what I mean, if you're looking for the historical Jesus, I don't think you're going to find it. I mean, people claim they know the precise spot, and they argue what is a cave versus a hotels and things of this nature, uh, or the year, the, there's endless debates and arguments about what year it was, uh, what time of year it was, uh, you know, where it was, 
But as I say, they appended it. And I, there was some other thing, like I asked the question, there were other religions called Mithraism. And they had gods who had a birth a lot like this. And so in order to get converts, or who knows what happened. Maybe they were just the large numbers then became in Christianity, whatever. Nevertheless, their version of their deity's birth and circumstances made it into the official records. We don't know what the circumstances were and things like that. So yeah, they kind of incorporated. In the end, it's not a bad story. I can take it. Yeah, I said, if you, where's there any talking about holidays? I spent a lot of time researching holidays. They all have a little strange record, you know, traditions and things like that. Um, I don't, you know, there are good occasions here uh, to get together. And yeah, the origins of them are always kind of interesting. But anyhow, thanks a lot, and thanks for the music. You're welcome. Okay. Hey. Well, thanks, Charlie. Um, I'd actually would like to be like Charlie in the sense that uh, I, I also want to give a, an eclectic uh, speech, uh, <laughs> revival, let's say. Uh, last week's uh, Chicago Sunday Tribune, the business section, uh, there was a story <laughs> about the uh, <laughs> electric power grid. <laughs> And uh, it said during the polar vortex last year, there was almost a complete collapse of the grid. Uh, we were in danger of a brownout. Um, the, the coal plants that are still running had problems with the conveyor belts freezing up. Uh, the gas pipeline infrastructure is really not uh, able to keep up with the capacity. Um, the only thing that really kind of saved us was that the nuclear plants were still running at uh, between 90 and 95 percent. Oh. And a lot of this they blamed on was all this excessive use of electricity, you know, which uh, you, know, you go around and see everybody had all these lights on the outside of their houses. And we were in danger of a brownout. Um, you know, we talked about uh, the 12th night uh, in my particular little town. Uh, it comes on January 6th. And uh, it's actually one of my most favorite holidays uh, in, in our town square. People bring their Christmas trees over and we set fire to them. <laughs> uh, one of the things we talked about also was traditions. And uh, one of the traditions that we've had at the college is people have walked in after the speech was given and given a rebuttal. Yeah. So I'm going to start another tradition tonight. I want to give a rebuttal for a speech that's going to happen next week. Okay. <laughs> you got to come. You got to yeah. go. So no. um, I used to be work. on the, the online uh, discussion group, and uh, I have dropped off because of uh, the next week's speaker. And, uh, and the, the main reason is because he has personally attacked me online. Uh, I know, you know, we, we have general rules here that we're not supposed to attack anyone, you know, present, whatever, but the, apparently online doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I got into with him was a few months ago, he kept spreading the hysteria about Ebola. And um, in, in the last month or so, I happened to be taking a long drive uh, for work, and uh, I was listening to NPR. And there was an interview with a lady who was the head of the uh, World Health Organization. And uh, she told a tale to the reaction of the Ebola hysteria. Um, because of all the media hysteria, that hospitals all the way across the United States now have storerooms full of personal protection equipment, you know, things like gloves and boots and masks and that. And also due to this media hysteria, she said, that there was, at one point, there was no surgical gloves available in drugstores in New York City. You know, people just panicked. They ran out and bought all this stuff. Okay. Then the other side of this was that the, uh, the personal protection equipment became the new hot costume for Halloween. <laughs> and people were going out and buying, you know, gloves and masks and all this stuff. Okay. So what did, what did this hysteria that was promoted by all these people have to do with this lady that was talking about it. She said that the people in Africa were now 
experiencing shortages of all this equipment that was necessary you know, to help fight and prevent the disease. And it's just because we were wasting money and time and, you know, and keeping this stuff you know, in uh, locked up in storerooms. Thank you. speaker just commented on. Um, we have a phenomenon at the college here where people that are not knowledgeable, uh, to put it charitably, to put it more accurately, uh, they are terrifyingly ignorant of basic facts that are known to people all over the world. And uh, Phil wrote a book, uh, article seven years ago, called The Disneyland of Militant Ignorance. It's a classic article you, you can find on the internet. People are ignorant of basic reality, and they're militant about it. And if you try to bring any facts in to counter their ignorant belief, which is based on total myth, no, no basis in reality at all, they will verbally attack you. Right. Or stand up and say that's crazy, or they will attack you online. You so now, you know, I learned a lot in seven years, and I would say uh, we have to, uh, you know, as Jesus put it, you know, uh, show compassion. We have to have compassion for people that have not. Uh, reached the point yet where you know knowledge spreads from person to person. And once you, you know something and work with it for a few years, it's common knowledge. But uh, if, if another person has never seen or encountered that, at first it sounds crazy. I, I've got to give you a couple of quotes. You know, from the censored news book this year, uh, a British author said, when a well-packaged lie is sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly fantastic, and its speaker a raving lunatic. Uh, Bertrand Russell, years ago, probably almost a hundred years ago, when he was writing about religion, he published a book called Why I'm Not a Christian, and he's talking about faith-based beliefs. And he said, if if a hundred major religions get together and all in one room and they all claim to have the one true uh, belief. He said, I can tell you all categorically, one of you may be right, but 99 of you are wrong. And I don't know which one that is. That's part of the problem. So you have to have compassion, uh, especially when you're dealing with faith. When you're dealing with reality, that's something else. Uh, I've talked about what I call the Catholic Church Syndrome in years past. You go into a congregation on Sunday, there's 500 people there, and you say, oh, by the way, Father O'Malley has been molesting your kids for the last 14 years. <laughs> about half of the congregation will just shut down. They'd say, well, you're slandering the man. That can't be true. I'm not going to look at the evidence. So more and more kids will get abused because these people are not able to open their minds a little bit and face a scrap of reality. The other half of the congregation says, if a shred of this is true, we have a legal, ethical, moral obligation to look at the evidence and take action. Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell were responsible for the ban on atmospheric testing, ban on nuclear testing. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. We had and also, Albert Einstein was the one, I think, he's been quoted widely as saying, doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial cover of truth. And that raises a formidable barrier to the penetration of actual truth on virtually any controversial subject. Galileo was in danger of being burned at the stake because he published the truth that the earth revolves around the sun. A whole bunch of people came along behind him with telescopes and said, hey, he was right. Took the church 300 years, but they had to issue an apology. Well. 
58,000 of our soldiers died in Vietnam and a couple billion Vietnamese people because of Americans were slow to face the reality of what our military was doing. 300,000 people in this country died during the AIDS epidemic because our public was unable to face the reality for 10 years uh, that other countries came to that these people were being poisoned. They weren't dying of AIDS. They were poisoned by the AIDS doctors. Initially, I'll make one last point. Uh, thousands and thousands of people all over the world are risking their lives and careers to get the word out to save lives and help us move forward. Uh, we don't have asbestos factories in America anymore. How many people died from asbestos and lung cancer? Uh, yeah. Smoking. Uh, thing, you know, we move forward in the direction of truth on many different issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, February 14th, if anybody's interested, we'll be talking about uh, how people <laughs> come to believe in certain myths and what to do to find a database of information that will help you, you know, counter that myth and learn what reality is on any particular subject. We'll have a lot of uh, printed matter in, uh, uh, on the night of February 14th. So uh, feel free to come and enjoy. Thank you. Okay. Let's let let's let our speaker have the last word. That is. Thank you. Where are all our atheists? Everybody loves. Everybody loves. I've heard it up. That's fine. They all went away. They're all going to go be be a church grown. Okay. Are you a Bears uh, fan or Cubs fan? Me? Yeah. Uh, I used to be Cubs, but I could get into the ballpark now and wear socks. At least the socks, uh, you can walk around. If there's no place to sit, you can walk around the field and watch the game. Visit the concessions <laughs> down there. The Wrigley, you have to go down under the stands. and you miss the game, you can only watch it on TV, so you might as well be at home. And uh, the last time I was a real Cub fan was 1969 when... They had yeah. players you could you knew and you could watch develop. Nowadays it's uh, run and buy and they disappear. And, and this new guy that they got, this uh, John Luster, my prediction is they got this guy guaranteed about $156 million or something like that over five years, whatever. He's going to throw out his arm the first year. Something's going to happen. And he ain't going to be there in the end. And a pitcher can only win 20 games in a year. So I don't know how one guy's paid that kind of money is going to really help the team. Some, some get faith, into the huh? Well, Are you sure you're not an atheist? That's a real lack right, of faith okay. on your part. All right. Just to, to get into things quickly, because I only got, what, five minutes? You've got uh, about 10 or so before the restaurant closes. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I, I just want to go quickly. In regards to what Andy just said about uh, priest abuse, uh, I had something set up, and now I can't find it. I'll find it in a minute, because I know where it is. <laughs> Here it is. And Jesus actually said this uh, in, in uh, Matthew, which was a, a future reference to clergy abuse, and this is what he said. Uh, this is, if you want to find this, Andy, it's uh, Matthew 18, 6 through 7. And it goes like this. Whoever causes one of these little ones over who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. <coughs> Woe to the world because of things that cause sin. Such things must come, but woe to one through whom they come. Okay? So Jesus did touch on clergy abuse. What was that section reference again? That, that section, uh, Matthew. Matthew. 18, 6 through 7 is where I took it from. The gospel. Okay, uh, going on, uh, so I took care of that. I'll mark that off my list because I want to get that in. Then uh, the other thing, uh, I want to go into the canonization of Scripture. I totally bypassed this in my talk. Uh, but since it came up, I'm going to throw it in. Uh, this is uh, this is essentially what I took from this book on the creed, uh, and I'll try and read it quickly if I can. 
Uh, the composition of the Old Testament was a slow process that took over a thousand years. Uh, the Hebrew Bible, Torah, I think it is what you call it, uh, classified sacred books into their three headings, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. A canon was drawn up by, in Palestine by the rabbis of Jemenia, I guess, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and new interpretations, and now it seems that the Hebrew canon was not originally fixed until the end of the second or third century. The New Testament canon was uh, assembled by trial and error over a long period of time, which many of you guessed. The rules of thumb were that it had orthodoxy, liturgical usage, and apostolic origins. Uh, in themselves, these norms were neither rigid nor uh, precise, but taken together, they reinforced one another and justified uh, of a book by the Christian community. Uh, for example, the Epistle of Barnabas was once accepted, but later rejected. The Book of Revelations, in the beginning, was rejected, but later accepted. The Councils of Hippo in 393 and Carthage in 397 indicate by the end of the 4th century, the Church had a consensus regarding the New Testament canon. It was at the Council of Trent in 1546, in response to the Protestant reformers, that the Catholic Church stated the position on which books are to be included. And today there are uh, 46 books uh, of the Old Testament it, because it considers part of Jeremiah, uh, Lamentations in Jeremiah, and there are New Testament plus the letters of Paul, 73 books in total. Okay, uh, so we got that canonization of how all that stuff came. Now, the other thing that we kind of touched on was you know, how the Romans got involved with Christianity. And the one guy that I didn't literally did not address totally, but I have in my notes is Constantine the Great. Uh, he associated uh, uh, his rise uh, with Christianity, uh, in, in, you know, the success of being uh, in line with God. He was uh, fighting. Uh, uh, God was helping him in his fights. He uh, fought in God's name, and, and, he, and he's the one that put the crosses on the shields of his soldiers. He eventually became emperor of both the East and West Rome. You know, he made his uh, home in Constantinople. He rejected pagan practices in Rome. Uh, he presided over the Council of Nicaea, which took settled the Arian uh, controversy, which was a highly regarded uh, uh, discussion on the, the uh, Jesus as God. Was he uh, a, a god of uh, a lesser, uh, the son of a lesser god, or was he Doug, equivalent god? When was that? The, the, Do you have a date on Yeah, the 325. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, AD. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so anyway, uh, Constantine could not mm -hmm. tolerate any factionalism, so he brought the bishops, 300 in number, he paid for their expenses to come to uh, Nicaea and settle the issue. Uh, and uh, that was the end of it. And uh, the other thing is, is that he feared, he, became, he was so entangled with God in his life that he feared that if the, he let this controversy, which was, they were actually warring with each other, that if he let it continue, God would lose favor with him and would not grant him any favors. So uh, he uh, made it his uh, mission to bring the, the factions together, which they did, and that's why we have from God to God, light to light, true God from true God in the creed today. So they just voted on what was true. Well, I mean, it was, it was the, you know, the 300 bishops, they, they you know, they, he forced the issue. He he was a great influence. He believed, uh, uh, listen to this, he believed as, as emperor uh, that he had a personal relationship with God, because, you know, a lot of these emperors associated themselves to be deities, uh, and that he was convinced that he was the uh, to, to be the evangelist uh, to bring uh, God's gospel uh, and spread Christianity throughout the world. So did the Tsar of Russia. And, and if you don't believe me, uh, you can find, look up look up in uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, and it'll tell you all the stuff. Uh, uh, it's uh, the Britannica that's called uh, uh, Macro, not Micropedia, the, the knowledge in depth. Uh, okay, so I got that. Oh, uh, regarding uh, your death, examination of conscience, I really believe, this is, uh, this is true, this is something important for you guys to remember. You guys will die in spirit, in your soul. You, you will take your conscience to your grave. If you have been good, you're going to experience some measure of heaven. If you've been deceitful, 
if you've been a murderer, if you rip people off, yeah. if you lied all your life, yes. you're going to pay a price in eternity. I'm serious about this. You will die with your conscience. In regards to birth control, no, it's not a totally accepted practice, but I'll tell you this. If you have 12 kids, maybe you can practice birth control. But if you're a rich couple and you make a million dollars a year and you're married, and you make no attempt to have children, believe me, you are not, uh, you know, morally right to practice birth control. You have a right obligation as a married person to bring new life into this world. And, that, and that's how the pastors would rule on it. Doug, what do I, got I got a question for you. Uh, no, wait, let me finish. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think I owe oh, uh, I think I pretty much covered it, 12th night, traditions. I talked about the Eastern Church and Western Church. Uh, the Bible stories, uh, uh, you know, uh, Charlie, the, the, the stories uh, are somewhat linked. You know, uh, 300 bishops got together uh, and, they, and they reviewed all this stuff and the stories. And, you know, in, 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 the, in the readings that we do in ABC readings, for example, tomorrow there's going to be a reading from Isaiah. There will be a reading uh, from the, the Hebrew, uh, the letters of St. Paul, and then there will be uh, the Gospel reading. And we do read the Old Testament. There are parts of the Old Testament that fit in with the, uh, the New Testament. And uh, so those things are linked. And, uh, you know, you can go to any church, Charlie, if you want, and look at the lectionary or talk to a priest, and they can show you how the readings are, in fact, linked. It's what the does... God. What does it take to get to heaven, Doug? Heaven? Heaven is going to be determined on your conscience. If you try to be a moral person, and like I said, that, that Jesus said, you know, uh, you try, try to do the corporal works of mercy, you gave to the poor, you housed the naked, uh, the, the homeless, clothed the naked, and you've done those things, or you instructed the ignorant, things like that, I think, you know, your chances of having some happiness in the afterlife would be good. If you didn't do any of those things, you know, you're going to experience hell, and, you know, there's going to be eternal embarrassment. If shame. You could, if you could, if everyone's going to heaven. Not if, everyone. No, yes. you'll see God. Yes. You will see everyone God, but you will not experience heaven if you have not been a moral person. Yes. If, no, you won't. Yes. Because you'll see God the way he is, and you'll feel shame. Like, just no. like the shame you would feel if you had a rich uncle and you never sent him a birthday card. You ne and you never uh, called them up or anything. You're going to feel a sense of shame. Why? Why did Jesus have to die then if you could do it yourself? Because he had he, he was he had to show us the way, the truth, and the light. That's what he said. Otherwise, how would you know how to live a moral life if Jesus didn't come? Some religions say you have to do it their way to get into heaven. Yeah. You know what? I believe in what you say. You know what? Uh, I believe in what you say. Uh, I honestly, I honestly thought that it was just a simple. I honestly thought it was just a simple proclamation of faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. No, what is good is faith without good works. And then Jesus says in the gospel, mm -hmm. those who say Lord, Lord, are not the ones that are going to be saved. But he who does the will of my Father, I emphasize will. What does God want us to do? It seems to depend on who you ask. <laughs> well, you ask me, and that's, that's what I say. And I gave you my personal views. It may not align with the church officially, but you know, all you guys have to do is die and find out if I'm right or wrong. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Let's, let's that's it. That's it. Thank you for your time, and your attention, and your participation. Oh, what? I'm off the. I'm off the. Right. Thank no, you all for coming. Do you always wear the Doug sign? I got your real Oh, I, I do because I, I want people to know who I am without having to ask. Without having to ask, who am I? So you always wear it? Only not outside.